she uh, she has received seven honorary degrees. She is an elect member of Royal Society of London as well as Canada. Uh, she is a member of US National Academy of Sciences. In 2008, she received North American L'Oreal UNESCO Women in Science Award. In 2021, recently, she's received ISSCR Achievement Award. In addition to this, Janet is the director and the president of Gardner Foundation. For people who don't know the Gardner Foundation, Gardner Foundation recognizes excellence of those scientists who have done substantial and creative work in an area which has helped move progress, the humanity or biomedical research for, forward towards uh, human benefits. Most of the recipients of the Gardner Found, uh, uh, Fellowship goes to uh, uh, receive the Nobel uh, Prize in future. Uh, she heads this foundation, as I told you. We are really, really grateful to have Dr. Janet Rosen today. It's pleasure and welcome Janet to CSIR IGIB. We really look forward uh, to your uh, uh, work in the areas of stem cell biology. Uh, to, well, to you, Dan. Thank you, and thank you very much. I'm going to share my screen um, so that we can get going here. And um, so what I'm going to do today is to talk to you about some of my work on the early embryo. So we're gonna start with my favorite stage of development, the blastocyst, but I'm gonna to talk, talk to you about the blastocyst in the context of stem cells and why understanding the blastocyst led us and others to developing stem cells that can be used and are important for uh, really uh, the future of stem cells as therapeutics. But then I'm gonna come back after we've gone through that part to the embryo itself because I'm also going to talk about how we can use stem cells to model early development, particularly in the mouse, but also moving on into human development. So we're going to start with the mouse, we're going to stem cells and their application, coming back to the embryo and talk about human development and how stem cells can help. So let's begin at the beginning with the blastocyst. This is the mouse blastocyst. It has three distinct cell types. It's the size of a speck of dust, about 100 cells, four days of development, just about to implant in the uterus. Uh, and the three cell types are shown here. And at the bottom are the questions that I've spent most of my career on and off working on uh, at different levels, first at the morphology level, then at the cell level, then at the genetic level and the molecular level. And still, we and others are still trying to address some of the fundamental questions here that come about from studying these first lineage decisions that an embryo undertakes from the egg to the blastocyst. Three cell types, trophectoderm, epiblast, and primitive endoderm. And the questions are, well, what do they give rise to? When are they restricted to cell fate? What are the pathways that establish these three cell types? And long uh, interest of mine for many years, can you derive stem cell lines that reflect these three lineages of the blastocyst. And we do know the answers to most of those questions, or we think we have a pretty good handle on most of those questions. Uh, and certainly the, fir the first, oops, let me just move this on here. The, the first question of what they give rise to, we know from many, many studies, from many people in my lab, many labs from the 1970s on with more and more precision, with more and more detail, we know that the outer cells, the trophectoderm of the blastocyst, give rise to the trophoblast cells of the placenta. Inside the inner cell mass has these pink cells, they're pink because they're stained with an antibody to OP4, which is a famous pluripotency gene. And the, the, basically these epiblast cells give rise to the entire fetus and are pluripotent. They give rise to all the somatic cells and germ, cell, germ lineages of the embryo itself. The layer of cells on the surface, the primitive endoderm, are another extra embryonic cell type. They are the endoderm cells of the yolk sac, that also uh, are part of the extra embryonic lineages, but not part of the fetus itself. We also know from lots of studies that these three lineages, by the time you see them at the blastocyst, are fixed. That is to say, they are restricted in their cell fate. You can't change them. You can do all sorts of things, but they are restricted to cell fate. And it is indeed clear that the epiblast is the pluripotent lineage. Pluripotent, not totipotent, because those cells don't give rise to the extra embryonic cell types. So, Knowing those, what we know about the three restricted lineages of the blastocyst, I had this question of, can you derive stem cells from them? And the answer is in a mouse, yes. 
And of course, the most famous stem cells from the blastocyst are embryonic stem cells. They arise from the epiblast cells of the inner cell mass. They grow indefinitely in culture. They express pluripotency transcription factors, OCT4, NANOG, SOX2. And importantly, when you put them back into a blastocyst, they behave like the epiblast cells that we defined in the embryo itself that give rise to the entire lineages of the fetus, shown here with blue, blue ES cells, but not to the yolk sac and not to the placenta. Many years ago now, so ES cells, we didn't derive these, but they were derived uh, in 1981 by uh, Matt Kaufman and, and Martin Evans in the UK and, and Gail Martin in the US. And ES cells really reflect this epiblast potential. Uh, we went on to show that you can derive stem cells from the other two cell types, trophoblast stem cells from the trophectoderm, their own transcription factors, they proliferate indefinitely, put them back in the blastocyst, they contribute to the placenta. And then Zen cells have their own transcription factors, proliferate indefinitely in different culture conditions, put them back in the embryo, they contribute to the yolk sac. So there are all three cell types. You can mimic and retain that sort of lineage restriction in these stem cell lines. So ES cells, like the epiblast, are pluripotent, but they don't normally give rise to Zen and TS cells. When people derived embryonic stem cells, the question we asked was, well, we know that in the embryo itself, the epiblast cells make a mouse. So if ES cells are really mimicking the epiblast, could they make a mouse? And this was an experiment that I did with my colleague Andras Naj in uh, Toronto, where we asked, could we uh, do a, a complementation experiment in which we would force the ES cells to take over the fetal compartment? And the experiment is shown here, it's called tetraploid complementation. We took the ES cells, which I told you in a chimera, make the epiblast, but not endoderm and placenta, and combine them with a tetraploid embryo, which you can make by fusing the two cell stages, so twice the normal amount of DNA. And we knew that these tetraploid embryos were quite good at making placenta and yolk sac, but not the fetus itself. Put the two together, the only way this is going to survive and make a viable embryo is if the ES cells take over the fetal compartment. And that's what we showed here. You see a very pretty blue fetus derived from the blue ES cells and the placenta and yolk sac are provided by the tetraploid. We went on to show that if you've got the right ES cells, and this has been repeated by many people many times since, then ES cells can, in this situation, actually make whole mice. These are mice derived from GF-labeled ES cells in culture. They are alive, they are fertile, they are normal. So in the right conditions, pluripotent ES cells truly are pluripotent. I think this was a very important experiment because it showed that these ES cells have the potential to make every cell type in the body. So if you could translate this mouse system into the human, then human ES cells, you wouldn't be trying to make a human, but it would suggest that human ES cells could be a source of cells for repairing almost any tissue in the body. That if they were truly pluripotent, they'd be a major source of cells for tissue repair. And of course, we know that human ES cells were derived. It took quite a long time from 1981 to 1998 when Jamie Thompson first derived human embryonic stem cells in a very similar manner to the way they'd been derived in the mouse from the human blastocyst, taking the inner cell mass and growing these cells in culture. They retain this pluripotent uh, undifferentiated state. And over the last many years now, it's been shown that these ES cells can differentiate in culture into very, very many different cell types of the body, including, in fact, the germline. So human ES cells then provide a potential endless source of pluripotent cells for possible therapy. Therapy would require that you control their differentiation and make the right cell types. There are concerns, ongoing concerns, I would say, about safety. The nice thing about ES cells is that they divide indefinitely, so you have an endless source of cells. The dangerous thing about ES cells is they divide indefinitely, and the potential that you could have tumorigenic potential retained is still a concern. There's concerns, obviously, about immune rejection if they're not matched to the patient to which you give them. Uh, and there are ethical concerns raised at the time and continuing about the use of human embryos in research, all of which make ESL work still somewhat uh, fraught. 
And of course that changed to a large degree with the discovery of induced pluripotent stem cells. Uh, Shinya Yamanaka in 2006 first derived P iPS cells in the mouse, and then one year later in human. Uh, and basically the concept here, I'm sure you're all aware, is you basically can take adult somatic cells and reprogram them, turn back the clock and help them behave just like those ER cells and the epiblast cells and the blastocyst itself. Reprogramming adult cells to the early embryo by essentially adding genes that we and others had shown were important for the pluripotent cells of the embryo itself. So you reprogram these cells and reactivate the early embryonic lineages and make iPS cells behave like ER cells. This gives you a source of cells that you can derive from anybody. You can model human disease because you can take iPS cells from people carrying genetic diseases. You can think about doing drug screening. And in the long run, because you can isolate them from individuals, there's the potential of using these for rejection-free transplantation, essentially matching stem cells to the person from which uh, for who requires the transplant. That's the long-term vision. And over these years, and it's not been that long really, there's been a huge uh, upswing and an amazing amount of work that's been done on ES cells and IPS cells that really has shown that these are incredibly powerful cells. And of course, the Nobel Prize for Medicine in 2012, very shortly, 2006, they were first arrived. 2012, the Nobel Prize went to John Gurdon, who was first, who actually taught me when I was an undergraduate. Uh, John Gurdon, uh, in Cambridge for showing that you could clone frogs, that you could reprogram an adult, adult nucleus to the beginning of development by cloning. And then Shinya Yamanaka, of course, by essentially showing the same thing without going back and doing nuclear transplant, that you could reprogram an adult cell. So 2012, the Nobel Prize to these uh, amazing gentlemen. So human ES cells and iPS cells really do and have and continue to open up new vistas in regenerative medicine. Um, so often I give these kind of talks and I give them to, in the public uh, to, you know, to encourage people to think about what stem cells might be. And there's always a danger that you start to hype what's going on here. So pluripotent stem cells have this amazing potential. It is absolutely true that they could make any cell type. It's absolutely true that if you could control this and expand them and, and, and grow them up and have the right clinical transplant protocols, you could really think about treating many, many different kinds of degenerative diseases. But how far are we? And I would say, actually, things are moving. In the last little while, we're really seeing uh, stem cell therapies from pluripotent cells moving towards the clinic. Um, here's just the ones that I think are, the, uh, are most active right now and have real potential. Spinal cord injury was one of the first targets uh, way back when Geron was involved in, in uh, deriving human ES cells. Uh, the idea here is not to replace the axons, but to, re to rewrap, uh, provide myelinating cells to help uh, prevent further damage of the axons themselves. And there are trials underway uh, around the world using this kind of approach. Excitingly, macular degeneration, you can generate retinal pigmented epithelium quite happily from ES and IPS cells. And there are trials underway, uh, Japan, Europe, US, uh, all looking at this approach and the results are looking quite, um, quite interesting. Parkinson's, uh, dopamine producing neurons. People have worked very hard to generate dopamine neurons from ES cells and IPS cells. Uh, very powerful differentiation protocols, the most important part, is you've got to get the right cell type to, to be working with. And now there are a couple of, of international consortia very close to um, beginning trials and there have been a couple of uh, individual trials going on in Japan with iPS cells uh, derived uh, dopamine neurons. Diabetes, type one diabetes, we know uh, in Canada, you have something called the Edmonton Protocol, which was developed to show that you could transplant islets and take patients with type 1 diabetes off insulin. But it's very hard to get islets from uh, uh, donors. 
uh, and uh, this is not a, a viable means to treat many patients. So it's a big push to drive islet type cells from ES cells. And this has moved also very rapidly. And we're seeing a couple of trials underway, including in Canada from a number of couple of different companies. And again, the first more anecdotal data, which you have to be very careful about, does suggest that this is going to be very successful in the, in the very short near future. A harder one, but a very exciting one, heart disease. When you have a, um, a myocardial infarct or several forms of congenital heart disease, could you replace the damaged heart muscle cells? Not just give uh, stem cells to try and uh, uh, prevent further damage, but could you actually replace the heart muscle cells? And there's a lot of work groups working to make heart muscle cells from ES cells and preclinical models suggest that this is going to work. And again, the groups are moving rapidly towards the first clinical trials. So it is happening. It really is happening. It happens where we have a good differentiation protocol, where we have a clinical protocol ready to put the cells in the right place, and we have the groups working on it at a high level and being funded appropriately. So stem cells can treat degenerative diseases, and we are seeing step, steps in that direction. I think more importantly and more excitingly, perhaps, uh, I'm not going to go into this in great detail because there's so many potential op options here. But the thing with IPS cells is you can model disease in a dish. And that opens up new ways of looking at disease that not just the stem cell therapies themselves, but understanding disease, developing new drug targets, testing tox toxicology, et cetera. And you can think of many different ways in which stem cells can be used to model disease. This is just one sort of composite image I've pulled together here of the kind of things that you can do with iPS cells from a patient with a disease. You can do make tissue lineages, two-dimensional models. I'm going to talk in a minute about three-dimensional organoid type models, which give you a, a, a better image and a better uh, model for actually how organ and tissue development occurs. And then you can think about taking these, either the cells, the 2D or the 3D models, and doing drug screens. You can ask whether uh, which, which of the different drugs will actually cause a response in the cells. You can test the toxicity of drugs this way. This is very important for cardiotoxicity, for example. You can do gene editing in these cells. If there's a genetic disease, you can gene edit it before you think about putting the cells back. You can bioengineer tissue equivalents. So you can really go from organoids to more complex tissue models. You can take the cells and put them back into mice where you can study their responses. And you can do more complicated lab on a chip type experiments where you can combine different cell types and really start to think about how cells respond and will respond in the human themselves to drugs and other drug treatments. Here's just my, one of my favorite examples. This is work from uh, Beekman and Hans Klevers in, in, uh, in the Netherlands. Actually, there's some work going on in Toronto in my lab and in Amy Wong's lab in a similar way. The idea here is to look at cystic fibrosis. Cystic fibrosis is caused by mutations in the CFTR gene. It's an iron channel uh, and it's expressed in all epithelia, but most of the, de um, the devastating effects are due to its expression in the lung, where you fail to clear mucus and so on in the lung that causes severe uh, lung disease. There are new drugs that are on the, coming on the market, on the market now, to treat uh, cystic fibrosis, but they're very expensive. And not every patient responds because although you can have the same mutation, the background mutation and the environment of the cells makes a difference as to the response. So you'd like to be able to test which patient are going to respond to which drug. And what you see on the top here is uh, work that was done by Beekman and Cleavers in which they took actually not pluripotent stem cell derived organoids, but actually direct stem cells from the gut. So these are stem cell biopsies and they make little gut organoids and uh, if you have a mutant, if you're a mutant for uh, this CFTR gene, so this is a CF-derived uh, organoid, and then you provide it uh, with the, the stimulant that would make the, the channel work, then in a normal case, the wild type cells will expand. You get these nice little cysts expanding, the mutants don't. If you treat them with drug, then the mutant cells respond. So you can measure the response of individual patients to these drugs by measuring the expansion of these uh, organoids, uh, uh, cysts. 
And you can make other kinds of organoids. You can make intestinal, you can make pancreatic, you can make lung, liver, kidney, really be able to study many different aspects of how cystic fibrosis acts and how drug treatments may, may impact on this. And of course, you can also think about doing gene therapy for cystic fibrosis. So those kind of gut organoids, the whole concept of an organoid is really grown dramatically over the last few years. And here's just a few of the different kinds of three-dimensional self-organizing structures that can be derived from pluripotent stem cells and can be used to understand normal development, also from iPS cells to be able to study specific diseases and to be able to actually test drugs gene therapy and other inter inter interventions in these cells. And here you can see them, they range from the lung, thyroid, liver, pancreas, right through to some of the more exciting ones that have been reported, which include the cerebral organoid, where you actually can get three-dimensional cortical structures forming from neural cells derived from pluripotent stem cells. So the opportunity to mimic different kinds of diseases with these 3D organoids is really important. And I'm going to come back to not organoids, but embryoids later in the talk. So these are really important for studying organogenesis and disease. So we can see that with these kind of approaches, you have this move towards precision medicine, patient-specific treatments, understanding the disease from iPS cells from a patient, understanding how they respond to treatment, uh, modeling disease in the dish. You can see how we can think about deriving personalized stem cell therapies, and then also you can see how we could think about genetic diseases with gene therapy, gene replacement or gene correction in the stem cells and then be able to replace them in the person themselves. So that brings us to the next game changer. We talked about ES cells and iPS cells and iPS cells being a real game changer in the stem cell field. But the next big game changer for all of us, I'm sure everybody who's watching today uses this kind of gene editing approach, whether you're using it in the lab to modify cells or whether you're really using it to modify plants, animals, bacteria, fungi, and of course, humans. And we know that the CRISPR-Cas9 system is derived from a bacterial immunity system. It's an extremely precise gene editing system. It targets DNA based on the uh, guide RNA sequences, and you can target cuts, and you can ta target repair, and you can target replacement at very specific sites across the genome. Highly specific, highly efficient, and I should say, very importantly, highly, very cheap. This is very easy system to bring into place and easy to scale up. So this has opened up enormous possibilities. Actually, yesterday I hosted a, uh, a panel with some of the gene editing folks on gene editing for resilience against climate change uh, and food insecurity. So there's, there's the applications are enormous. But here I just wanted to, of course, talk about in the concept of human disease doing somatic gene therapy to treat cancer, sickle cell disease, beta thalassemia, et cetera. Uh, there are many potential targets for gene editing uh, in different genetic diseases, single gene diseases, and here are just some of them. You can think about using gene editing to go directly into patients, so introducing the components through an AAV vector or other delivery systems and treat liver diseases, for example. Muscular dystrophy, I never thought could be attacked, but actually there's some very good preclinical data suggesting this could be an, an accessible target for gene editing. And then of course, you can think about treating stem cells, blood stem cells and other stem cells ex vivo and then putting them back. And here's one of my favorite combinations of stem cell therapy with gene therapy. And this is work from uh, people at the bottom here. This, this is Michaela De Luca and Grazia Pellegrini, who really have been working on skin stem cells. So you can take uh, epithelial cells from patients, expand them into sheets that then can be used to transplant back. And what they showed here was that a, children who, a child who had this serious uh, junctional epidermolysis bullosa uh, mutation, it's a mutation in the, in the collagen genes, essentially the whole skin blisters. So this child had 
skin blisters all over. They found a small piece of skin. They fixed the mutated gene by gene editing, expanded the cells, and then over time transplanted these cells back. And here's the little boy who was really close to death and is now running around and playing football. Uh, this is an ex extremely exciting example of how you can combine stem cell therapy and gene therapy. So that's a sort of skim of where stem cell, pluripotent stem cell uh, work has gone from understanding it in the embryo to translating it to the human, to translating it to clinical applications. But now let's go back and go back to my favorite stage of development, the blastocyst. And let's talk a little bit more about how the embryo, the blastocyst itself is made, and then talk about how what we know in the mouse translates or doesn't translate into what we know about the human and how can we use stem cells to have a better understanding of human development. So let's return to the blastocyst. I named some key transcription factors, uh, OT4, SOX2 in, in pluripotency, CDX2 in trophectoderm, uh, SOX7 and SOX17 in Zen cells. They were all essentially identified from stem cells and they re are required for maintaining the, the appropriate stem cells from the blastocyst. But if you go back to the embryo, what kicks this off? So the stem cells tell you about how the lineage is maintained, but they don't tell you how you got from an egg to a blastocyst. So what signals the onset of inner cell mass versus trophectoderm and fate? And if you start looking at this, which we can do now, because we can tag the genes that are important for these lineages with different fluorescent markers, here we're seeing CDX2 tagged with GFP. We're seeing SOX2 tagged with HALO and then picked up with a, a red fluorescent dye. And what you're seeing there is that first of all, CDX2 kind of comes on everywhere and then becomes slowly restricted to the outside. As it gets restricted to the outside, then and only then do we see SOX2 coming on in the inside. So this gives us a clue that CDX2, which is absolutely required for the further development of the trophectoderm, is really the driver of this initial lineage decision. And you have to turn down CDX2 to get the pluripotency genes to come on. And that's basically the case. Uh, if you knock out CDX2, then the pluripotency genes sort of come on everywhere. You don't get the lineage decision. So what is it that leads to this segregation? Something must be signaling. And so is there a signaling pathway that's upstream of this CDX2 SOX2 decision? And the answer there is yes. And the answer is the HIPPO signaling pathway, which that we know now, but there was a surprise at the time. Was in 2009, we had a surprise when we looked at the nuclear localization of YAP. YAP is a co-activator co of the T transcription factor family, and YAP is known to be downstream of the HIPPO signaling pathway and phosphorylated by the, the LATS kinase, which is part of the HIPPO signaling pathway. And what uh, we saw in these experiments, which were done in collaboration with Hiro Suzaki's lab in Japan, that if we stained with an antibody to YAP uh, during early development, YAP's everywhere. But as you start to get outside and inside cells segregating, we see that YAP becomes nuclear localized in the outside cells and excluded from the nuclei in the inside cells. Obviously, if it's not the nucleus, it can't be acting. So this exclusion and nuclear localization suggests then that YAP localization is a driver of the trophectoderm lineage. And if you overlay this with the antibody stain to CDX2, you'll see that they overlay almost directly. So this is really then YAP localization is leading to the downstream expression and restriction of CDX2 to the outside cells. And cutting many, many experiments by my lab, by Sazaki's lab, by other labs, uh, we still don't have all the details of what's going on here, but this is the general model we think of what's going on now to lead to the segregation of the trophectoderm and the inner cell mass. So in the inside cells, this complex of the, of the LATS kinase, along with EK adherence, so the cells have to be sticking together. If they don't stick, this doesn't work. Uh, angiomotin and NF2, this is active. If this is active, it phosphorylates YAP, keeps it out of the nucleus, and you don't get trophectoderm expression, no CDX2. You do secondarily get SOX2 expression. 
in the outside cells, this complex is torn apart because at the apical uh, domain of these polarized cells is a layer of cortical actin, which localizes angiomotin and lats uh, two, but segregates it from this complex. It's not active. YAP is not phosphorylate, can enter the nucleus, activates trophectoderm. So this is basically how we think it's working. As I say, details to be worked out, particularly the importance of mechanical tension here, which has been shown to be upstream of YAP in other situations as well. And there has been some indication that the same pathway may play a role in human development as well. So that's YAP, HIPPO, signaling a post-translational event that leads to the inner cell mass trophectodon, and it's driven by cell position and cell polarity. There is another decision that the embryo takes before it implants in the uterus to make the pluripotent and the primitive endoderm. So you've got to make that primitive endoderm layer on the cell surface. Um, and if you just look at it, you might imagine, in fact, I did imagine and published papers suggesting that this was the case, that this is also a position polarity event, that, that cells on the surface become polarized, turn on pathways that become primitive endoderm, and the pluripotent cells stay inside. But if you look at the expression of the transcription factors that are involved here, you see that it doesn't really look that way. Before this point, there's a mosaic. Everybody's mixed up together. And then if you do videos, you'll see that they actually segregate over time. So we're looking at GATA6 and NANOG here. So GATA6 is sort of everywhere. NANOG starting to come on. And you'll see that they're all mixed up at the beginning of this process. And then over time, they begin to segregate out. And if you look carefully, you're going to see that NANOG, which is the pluripotent gene, becomes restricted to the inside of the inner cell mass and GATA6 is on the cell surface. So this is a very different process. It's also driven by a different signaling pathway. And again, cutting a very long story short, we showed that FGF signaling, FGF ERK signaling is really key here, and that cells are actually reading out local levels of ERK signal to determine one way or another. So this is a switch mechanism. If you have high FGF, you become a primitive endoderm. If you have low FGF signaling, you become epiblast. And you can show this, if you treat embryos and block uh, signaling, all the inner cell mass cells become epiblast. Same number of cells, they all become pluripotent. On the other hand, if you do the same experiment and treat them with excess FGF uh, signaling, all the cells become primitive endoderm. And of course, in normal development, the embryo is somehow, and we still don't understand this, somehow weighing the local levels and ending up with roughly the right number of cells. So you've got two lineage decisions, and it's kind of interesting as a developmental question, two lineage decisions taking place in pretty close proximity, looking as though they could be similar, but they're not quite different. The first one is position dependent activation of hippo signaling, and it's partially conserved in humans. The second segregation is stochastic activation of FGF signaling followed by cell sorting, different process entirely. And I'm not going to show you the data. This does not appear to be conserved in humans. There is no evidence that FGF ERK is the player that drives this lineage decision in the human, and yet the lineage decision occurs quite happily. So we've got two different mechanisms. We've also got potentially non-conservation of mechanisms when we go from mouse to human. So that leads us to saying, I've spent a lot of my career working on the mouse. We have a very good understanding of how mouse development occurs. But what do we know about human blastocyst lineage commitment? I've said that we, don't, we see that the signaling pathways may be uh, different, but are the genes involved? Well, the genes that we think are important for specifying lineage fate are expressed and almost certainly required in human embryo development as well. But the timing of their expression can differ between mouse and human. So if we go right back to this paper from Kathy Nyakan and Kevin Egan in 2013, where they looked just by antibody staining at different stages of human embryo development from the eight cell through to the blastocyst stage, and they looked at OCT4, they saw OCT4 was sort of everywhere and became, didn't get restricted to the inner cell mass until really very late expanded blastocyst stage. On the other hand, CDX2, which I showed you coming on gently and gradually all through early development and then getting restricted as the blastocyst forms and prior to blastocyst formation, CDX2 doesn't get expressed until the blastocyst stage. 
it's not actually expressed during this, this time when the lineages are segregating. So very different timing of events here. And if you look at other gene expression patterns, the same thing occurs. It looks as though lineage specific gene expression is delayed in the human compared to the, the developmental stages compared to the mouse. So how does this timing of lineage expression, of gene expression uh, reflect lineage commitment? I told you in the mouse, I didn't show you any experiments, but I've done a lot of them over, over the last many, many years and, and done with Esther post we have done some very detailed experiments in the last few years. We know that the lineage commitment in the mouse, the trophectoderm lineage is actually restricted at the late morula stage prior to early blastocyst formation. The inner cell mass lineage gets restricted during early blastocyst formation. But certainly by the time you get a normal looking blastocyst, the two lineages are quite restricted. What happens in human? Well, the answer is lineage restriction appears to be delayed in human along with the gene expression pattern. A couple of experiments, obviously there's not a lot of experiments and not the detailed experiments that we've been able to do in the mouse, but there are some experiments that indicate that this is the case. This was the first one published in 2013, where this group were able to take human blastocysts uh, donated from IVF clinics. They were able to take human blastocysts and dissociate them and show that if they took uh, inside cells here, we take the cells from the inside of the embryo, whoops, and re-aggregate them, they could regenerate a blastocyst. So this is from a fully expanded day, day six, day five, day six blastocyst. If they took only outside cells, then they could also regenerate a blastocyst. So this really suggests then that even at the blastocyst stage, either the inside or the outside cells are not restricted and can regenerate the blastocyst formation. The same experiment in the mouse, you would not be able to regenerate a blastocyst at this stage. A more recent experiment from uh, Ger Guo and Austin Smith uh, showed that when they were trying to make, to, to grow from the human, they were trying to grow na naive uh, embryonic stem cells. They were able to show that if they took the, the epiblast from the inner cell mass, from the expanded blastocyst, they could indeed get naive uh, uh, human ES cells. But in those cultures, they also got, clearly got trophectoderm cells. Uh, and if you do the same, again, if you did this in the mouse, you do not get trophectoderm, you do not get TS cells, you only get ES cells. So suggesting then that even in the blastocyst itself, the naive epiblast cells have retained some capacity to make trophectoderm. Suggesting then there really is a difference in timing between the mouse and the human in gene expression and in lineage restriction. So why is that? People always ask me that. I don't have a full answer to it. I can tell you, that everything about the early embryo uh, development in the mouse and the human, there is a difference. It's a major difference, a major delay in human. And the first and perhaps most important delay is the time of zygotic genome activation. So in the mouse, uh, the, the zygotic genome is activated at the two cell stage. There's a major uh, degradation of, of maternal messages uh, and the two, you get this major activation of the genome at the two cell stage. This has to get all sorted out and turned down. And then you go on and start seeing expression of the genes that I talked about, CDX2, OP4, and you see the beginning of lineage uh, se segregation such that by the blastocyst, you've really undergone this lineage segregation. In the human, zygotic genome activation takes place at the eight to 16 cell stage. The major activation is delayed by couple of cell divisions compared with the mouse. Now, while you're doing zygotic genome activation, the whole chromatin is open, you get retroposons activated, it's a mess. Till you sorted that out, you're not really going to be, and you aren't, expressing linear specific transcription factors. So at this point then, it means that in the, in the human, the linear specific transcription factors expression is delayed. It has to be delayed because you've got to get over zygotic genome activation. The morphology of the blastocyst appears to be running on its own clock. So morphology precede, precedes gene expression in the human. In the mouse, the two go pretty well alongside each other. So that means in the mouse, we can get these three cell types. What does this mean in terms of getting stem cells from human? Blastocysts. We know we can get ES cells, and if you push hard, you can get naive type ES cells. 
but can you get TS cells and can you get Zen cells? At what stage are these lineages restricted that you can get these stem cell lines? So differences in stem cell states, mouse to human, it is clear that the human blastocyst lineage development begins from a different environment than the mouse because of the zygotic genome activation story. There is this also the possible, it's been hard to get what we call naive epiblast ES type cells from human. And it may just be that it's very transitory in the human. Uh, and it's still at the stage where you get uh, transposon expression occurring. So it's just not very stable. And it is true that you can make naive human ES cells, but it, it requires more complex modifications than it is the cat parent in the mouse. Um, and there's also something else that's a bit um, esoteric, but the mouse embryo undergoes diapause. Humans do not. And the diapause mechanisms may help stabilize the naive state. So that's why you get an easier, naive, but restricted ES cell type in the, in the mouse, whereas you don't see that in the human. So, that's what we know. We know that ES cells start in a different place. We know that human naive cells and mouse naive cells are not necessarily equivalent. We know that the signaling pathways that are involved are not necessarily equivalent. But can we actually model early development using stem cells in mouse and human? So uh, I told you in mouse, we make ES cells, TS cells, and Zen cells. Um, and Many people always ask me, well, if you've got all those three cell types, what happens if you put them together? Do you make an embryo? So we played around with that a bit, but we didn't push it very hard. Magda zernich Gertz's lab a few years ago now showed that if they took ES cells, TS cells, and Zen cells, mixed them up randomly, grew them in a three-dimensional sort of matrigel system, then they could get segregation of these cells into something that looks like an early post-implantation mouse embryo. One of these is a real embryo. One of these is what they call ETX-like embryoid model. I don't know which is which. I think this is the embryoid model and this is the embryo, but it's quite dramatic. It is, of course, uh, a chosen, a, a well-chosen uh, example, but still they do sort out and they behave like the cells in the embryo, but they behave like the post-implantation, not the blastocyst itself. Uh, Perhaps more excitingly, Nicola Rivron, about the same time, was able to generate what he calls blastoids, which do mimic many aspects of blastocyst development. And he did that by taking ES cells, putting them in little wells in culture, and taking a little clump of ES cells, sprinkling TS cells on them. And then what you see in the best case scenario is that these make little structures that do indeed look very similar to uh, mouse blastocysts. They clearly have an outer layer of trophectoderm and an enclosed group of inner cell mass like cells. The initial ones don't make much primitive endoderm. They've improved this since. The trophectoderm is not necessarily quite the right cell type. They've been improving that. But these do look in many ways kind of like a, a mouse blastocyst. So the suggesting then you could mimic the blastocyst formation by cells, by taking stem cells in culture. And of course, you could scale this up to a large scale and begin to study uh, some of the events in more detail. But if you take either the ETX or the blastoids in the mouse and put them back into the uterus, they don't go very far. They will implant. You've got trophectoderm, which is required to cause the, the implantation response, but you don't really make uh, a normal embryo. So this is partly, I think, because the stem cells that we and others derived, ES cells, TS cells, and Zen cells, are not really equivalent to early blastocyst cell types. They're more like the cells about to go in implantation. So you want to go earlier. Could you actually capture a pre-blastocyst state, so a totipotent state? And this is a, a, an active area of research. Uh, we've been working on this, and other labs have been working on this over the last few years, to see whether you could capture a totipotent stem cell type. The answer in the mouse is maybe, and I'm not going to go through the details here, but if we just think about early development, what we see here is that the zygote uh, and the two cell stage, these are totipotent. Single blastomers can make a mouse. And even at the eight cell stage, the experiments show that the cells are able to make all the cell types of the embryo itself. And it's not till the blastocyst that you get the restricted lineages and the restricted stem cells. So can you capture the two C light stage? Yes, you can, but it's not stable. More recently, there's been a series of experiments trying to capture what are called expanded potential, totipotent cells, more equivalent to the sort of pre-blastocyst eight cell stage and using different approaches, 
capturing a cell type that does appear to have expanded potential. So it's going to be interesting to see how well these totipotent cells actually can generate blastoid models. We uh, looked at some of the early ones, these two from uh, Pentao Liu's lab and from uh, Hong Kui Deng's lab. And we couldn't, in, in a series of experiments that I did with my colleagues in, in Belgium in Sweden and in the US, we couldn't really identify that these were truly totally potent. They were not able to really generate to effect to them. But some of the more recent ones do look as though that may be the case. So totally potent cells, possibility, but it's hard work and you have to do something special to try and capture totally potency. So, I would say that it's nice to have stem cell models in the mouse, but we have embryos. We can work with embryos. You can get lots of embryos and there's fantastic work, single cell analysis type work that goes on with genetic manipulation, single cell analysis, in vivo lineage tracing, uh, in vivo imaging to really study mouse development. But it's not true if you want to study human development. It's hard to get human embryos. There are ethical concerns, there's access issues, uh, and you, know, you just don't have the quality of embryos that you can get from a mouse. So it would be nice to be able to model human development using human stem cell models. So what, what is possible? How are there human stem cells like ES, TS, and Zen? Naive cells would be equivalent to the mouse ES cells. So you can certainly start with those. People have been there, it took a long time. We tried very hard to make human TS cells. Uh, Okai et al. in 2018 achieved this in the first place with a different uh, a set of signaling pathways, again, showing differences, mouse to human, but there are human TS cells. Zen cells, also not as easy as it seemed in the mouse. Uh, we showed that you could overexpress SOX7 and generate Zen cells. Uh, uh, Josh Brickman's lab, show that they could change the cultural conditions and again get NN, what they call NN cells from human ES cells that appear to be like Zen cells. So it's possible. So can you combine those in the human and make embryo models? Well, interestingly, nobody's reported doing that in the human, which suggests to me that it doesn't work very well. And we still don't have the right cell types. What's been interesting instead is going back to this fact that the human blastocyst is less lineage restricted than the mouse. And the suggestion is that human ES cells, which come from the epiblast of blastocyst, may themselves be less lineage restricted and can themselves be used to generate models of blastocyst formation. So human naive cells, are they actually not lineage committed? Their expression profiles actually show similarities to early blastomeres as well as to the epiblast. Transposon expression looks like cleavage. Expanded potential and naive cells have been shown in many different hands now to be able to generate trophoblasts quite readily in culture, much better than the mouse cells. And I'll just list a whole set of these experiments. Uh, Jose Polo's lab in Australia showed that during reprogramming to iPS cells, you actually get an intermediate that has trophoblast like cells. And just recently, there are a couple of papers showing that you can get 8C like cells, like the 2C cells in the, in the mouse, the 8C like cells with properties of 8 cell blastomers. So there's a, there's a less lineage restriction and maybe stem cells in the human that you could use to model embryo development directly. And in fact, Blastoids in humans have been used, have been made from human ES cells, making use of this plasticity. And there've been a series, this is just some of them, and there's an increasing number of these experiments now. These are some of the most high, high profile ones where they claim to be able to generate human blastoids from naive ES cells. Uh, usually directly, this is this is uh, an experiment from Jun Wu, um, this is from uh, uh, Nicola Rivron's lab, this is from uh, Austin Smith's lab, all taking naive cells, growing them in suspension, and generating really what look pretty good looking models of the human blastocyst. This is from uh, Jose Polo's lab, where they took advantage of this reprogramming activating trophectoderm and try to capture that midstream and generate structures that they claim look like blastoids. So this is potentially very exciting. These are really large numbers of models of early human development. Question is, how close are they? Well, if you go into those papers, none of them claim that these are perfect. And it's cl clear in all cases that some of these uh, structures have heterogeneous cell types, not just the three lineages you would hope to see. 
particularly the trophectoderm, which is key if you want to generate a blastoid model, then the expression data supporting that is not always robust. And again, with my colleagues in the Karolinska Institute, and this time in collaboration with Jumping Foos Lab at, at the University of, of Michigan, we looked again at the expression data in these published blastoid papers and compared them with a, a, a cluster analysis that uh, Frederick Lanner's lab did with Karolinska, where they took all the published data on direct human embryo expression and were able to identify the sort of the trophectoderm cluster, amnion, mesoderm, epiblast, the early pre-implantation, endoderm, et cetera. And then asked, where do the, the single cell data in these published ones overlie with those data? And you'll see what you're looking for, what you'd hope to see is what you see uh, in this one here, which is the one from Guo Guo and Austin Smith, that most of the cells that have been identified as epiblast, drop in epiblast, trophoblast in trophoblast, and primitive endoderm actually out here in the hyperblast. You'll also note, however, there's not many cells in this case, and these were clearly very carefully selected embryos and the cell number is small. The other data sets have many, many more cells, and you can just see with the little colored dots that there is a lot of heterogeneity. But these two are not bad. This one is the outlier. This is Jose Polo's, where they were looking during reprogramming, and what they call trophectoderm really maps very carefully and nicely onto what in the embryo would be called the amnion. And we think that that's the case, that these are not trophectoderm cells. And there's a lot of interesting uh, data out there suggesting that during early development, the, in the human, the amnion forms early and has properties of the trophectoderm. And recent pa uh, paper from uh, Peter Rudd Gunn's lab suggests that that's what's going on here. So there's a confusion, an ongoing confusion between amnion and trophectoderm. So it looks exciting. We're not there yet. Uh, these are stem cell models of the blastocyst formation. You're going to hear another talk later in this, in this series from Miki Ebisuya, where she's going to tell you about modeling different stages of, of human development, the gastroloid and the somite formation from embryonic stem cells. So there's a lot of excitement and then being able to use stem cells to model human development. But be careful, they're not identical to the embryo. The epigenetic state of the starting stem cells is not always clear and certainly is imperfect. The linear state where you're coming from is also unclear. There's no, there's no replacement in the end for direct study of embryos themselves, including non-human primates. That has to be the gold standard against which you compare these embryo models. But they can be used to study specific limited events, gastrulation, somite formation, and cell-cell interactions. Will they ever make functional embryos? So the better and better you get at making a blastoid starts to lead you into ethical concerns because what if you actually succeed in modeling the blastocyst and generate something that would have the potential to cross the boundary and become close to a real embryo? So this is an ongoing discussion too. And I'm just gonna end here by talking briefly about the ISSCR stem cell guidelines. Uh, the recent revisions, I was part of these discussions where we spent a long time talking about embryo and gastroid models and came up with these uh, conclusions. That if you're making an embryo model, whether it's an, a blastoid or a gastroloid or any embryo model in human should never be transplanted into a human or animal uterus. These are in vitro models and should be restricted to in vitro development. They are not for reproductive purposes. If you make an integrated model, which is what we call a blastoid that has all the cell types that could allow further development, they have to be careful and be rigorously reviewed. The scientific rationale has to be clear. Ethical issues have to be considered. And if you're culturing any of these, the length of time in culture for embryos or stem cell models should be appropriate for the question under study, uh, unless of course restricted by law. So lots to learn still about lineage identities in intact embryos, particularly in the human, how they relate to stem cell states and how to use all this information to make better stem cell models to be able to mimic uh, all early development and normal development, but also to be able to make better models for studying human disease. And it does all begin uh, and end with the blastocyst. Uh, and I just wanna thank uh, along the way, 
over the years. Of course, I talked about some of the early work, but some of the more recent work where we've been looking at these, these stem cell models in mouse and human. There's been a collaboration, a very nice one, uh, with Esther Postwein in, in Princeton, uh, Vincent Pasquet in Belgium, Frederick Lana in uh, Karolinska, and Jan Ping Fu in Michigan, and my lab, Alex Murray and Peter and Brian Bradshaw. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Janet. Fantastic. Uh, very, very elaborate information about stem cells. Uh, very much uh, appreciate this uh, from our students community, as well as uh, from my lab and institution. Uh, now we can take the questions. Pooja, do we have questions uh, in the chat box? Yeah, can please so we have one question from uh, Dr. Surendra Ghaskadbhai. He's asking, have mouse uh, human chimeras been made? If so, how does the pre-implantation development progresses in these? Right, so people have taken uh, human embryonic stem cells or iPS cells and put them into mouse blastocysts and in some cases have transplanted those back into the mouse and asked how do they develop? And the answer is they don't develop very well at all. Uh, most of those experiments were done not with naive human ES cells, but were with what we call primed ES cells. And if you took primed ES cells in the mouse and put them into a mouse embryo, they don't do very well either. But even when you take naive human ES cells or extended potential cells, there have been a few publications where they claim to have contributions. But if you look at the data there, the contributions, if they're at all, are extremely small. So it really doesn't seem that they behave very well. They will integrate into the blastocyst, but they don't, uh, the combination and the timing of events post-implantation does not seem to favor this. Um, so this is not particularly, uh, I would say, a useful way of studying human potential, which is one of the reasons why these sort of stem cell models become more interesting, because you have the potential then to really take human ES cells and embryo models and allow them to develop further in vitro and model some of the early post-implantation events, for example. So rather than using the chimera. Uh, so okay. I, I can I ask a question before I, I go, go ahead? ahead. <laughs> the, Dr. Uh, Janet, uh, the question is regarding this uh, blastoid system, which has come recently. I thought if you could a little bit elaborate more. So uh, how does one use the blastoid system uh, for modeling diseases? Uh, we heard about how one can use this to study development, but what is the scope of it to study the developmental diseases? If you could so, elaborate. Yes. So, yeah. so I think that the the uh, the embryo models, the blastoids, the gastroids, the embryo, whatever, uh, are going to be important to give us some insights, particularly into the events around uh, implantation. So we know that in humans, there's a huge amount of early embryo loss, and a lot of that early embryo loss takes place at implantation. So people are using these human blastoids in combination with, with, with uh, endometrial organoids to try to really mimic the implantation process in vitro. So I think that's going to be important. We can also see it hasn't happened yet, but you can imagine that some of the early uh, single gene genetic diseases actually begin their effects very early in development. And so you would be able to model some of those by being able to mimic it mimic the early development processes. So it's a combination, I think, of studying perhaps more about the normal developmental processes, but certainly as time goes on, you're gonna see that the genetic components will be put into that as well. So it becomes one of, one of the many tools for studying these events. Yeah, yeah cool. Uh, <clears throat> Thank you, Dr. Razan. Uh, we have one more question uh, from Manoj Kashyap. He congratulates for the talk and he asks, have the experts tried to exploit splicing events in changing the cell types from one to another type in the context of stem cell? Well, it's an interesting question because in fact, one of those list of papers that I put about making totipotent stem cells in the mouse, uh, actually what they did was, was to in, uh, inhibit the spliceosome. So they clearly, uh, changed a whole load of splicing of many, many genes. Uh, and some of those splicing changes then seem to reactivate the pathways that would allow the cells to retain a broader potential. So yes, uh, it can be done, has been, has been done. I hope Manoj, you got your answer. Uh, 
we have one question from Sundara Macharya. Uh, he uh, asks, a uh, curious question. He says it's a curious question. You showed that there is a timing delay during development between mouse and human. Does the timing delay during development is correlated with the hierarchy of the organism in phylogeny? Uh, probably, probably not. Uh, I think it's, it's it, if you look across mammals, the timing of zygotic genome activation varies uh, across different species. And it's not clear to me that there's any particularly uh, related to their sort of develop, um, phylogenetic hierarchy. Uh, what we do know is, of course, that in mammals, there's a huge amount of variation in how you make the first cell types in the embryo, particularly the trophoblast and the placenta. So there is, there's a big variation from species to species in how those cell types get set aside. And I think it's because in this case, it does go back to phylogeny. Mammals are a relatively recent uh, event in the big evolutionary scheme of things. And the concept of making a placenta to allow viviparity is still being played around with, if you like, evolutionarily. So we are not, it's not set in stone how you get there. What is set in stone is by the time you get to establishing the body axis and the somites and the anterior posterior patterning, Hox genes, all those genes that are highly conserved across the whole of animal evolution are used in the mouse as well. But how you make the first cell types you know, Drosophila don't have trophoblast. So how do we make trophoblast in mammals? You pick up a gene, CDX2. CDX2 is a caudal gene. Caudal is a gene in Drosophila that makes the posterior end of the embryo. Oh. Caudal genes in, hum in mice and humans are required for posterior development. But you pick up and you use the same gene to also make trophectoderm. So I think there's a, a bit of picking and, and choosing, if you like, that, ev that evolution has done to, to make these new cell types. And I don't think you can put them in an easy phylogenetic hierarchy, but it's an interesting question. That sounds the answer. So, so Janet, along the similar lines, if I may extrapolate, uh, because the timing of mouse and human um, ESC cell division also differs. So is there any link between zygotic gene activation with the cell cycle over there? Because the division times are different. Uh, it's a good question. I've actually asked that question of people working on human embryos and I can't get a straight answer. Um, <laughs> because we, we do know in, in the mouse that, that the two cell stage, there's a very long S phase and, and uh, G1 phase of development. It's um, very, very long and then Psychotic genome activation occurs, all hell breaks loose, and then you start running on a better cycle. In the human, you would predict that that would be true at the eight cell stage. I can't get anyone to give me a hard answer on whether that is the case. So I'm not sure. I think it's an interesting question and pe people, if they're not looking at it, they should be looking at it. <laughs> sure. Thank you. Um, do we have any more questions? Is there anyone who's still up with the question? Because since the Dr. Rosent is here with us, I would uh, take if there is any more question, although we are running short of time now. Um, do we have? Uh, looks like no. Um, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, I, uh, on behalf of uh, IGIB, I really thank Dr. Janet Rosen for uh, giving us wonderful insights. Uh, in the area of stem cell biology, telling us about ethics, what is possible, doable, what is not possible at given moment, what we don't understand. And uh, we have learned quite a bit. Uh, thanks a lot for sparing your weekend time uh, to talk to us, our students. They are really happy about it, excited. And we are trying to grow our stem cell community over here. Uh, you have really played an important role in this process. And I would also like to thank all the people um, who have a uh, genuine interest in stem cell biology to join on a Saturday evening to listen uh, to the web, uh, webinar series, what is going on. And uh, uh, thank you, Janet. I'll uh, get in touch with you about certain things uh, which uh, I would like to discuss going forward offline. Um, Pooja, uh, if you would like to make any comment of the next series, please go ahead. 
Yeah, so Dr. Janet Rosen has already introduced our next speaker uh, on the line, but to formally put up to our audience. Uh, next in line, we will have Dr. Miki Ebisuya from EMBL Spain. Another interesting talk on the way, and I would uh, request all our audience to please join us for a very interesting talk. And I would personally thank Dr. Janet Rosen for spending her time. And such a wonderful talk. Uh, I am personally a fan of yours. And thank you so much for uh, coming to us and taking up all the questions. And it was a wonderful talk. Um, thank you. It was a pleasure to be here, uh, if only virtually. And I'm certainly very willing to uh, continue to be engaged and answer any questions that people have offline. So thank good luck with the series. Thank you. Thank you, Janet. Lovely meeting you or, or virtually. And I look forward to communicating with you in future. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Bye. Uh, thank you, everyone. We are now concluding uh, today's webinar.